In this final lecture of the course, we'll look at behavioral, cognitive, and social elements of learning and how they manifest in personality. Let's start by discussing the origins of learning theory, which is traditional behaviorism. Behaviorism at its heart is the view that all human behavior is a result of conditioned responses. Personality, from the perspective of traditional behaviorism then, is simply the characteristic patterns of behavior that someone engages in throughout their life based on what they've learned. If that pattern is outgoing and social, we could call it extroverted. If that pattern is determined and detail-oriented, it might look like conscientiousness. While more contemporary theories acknowledge the profound impact of cognitions and emotions, as well as inherited biological influences, these factors were ignored in early behaviorism because they are viewed as much more challenging to observe, objectify, and scientifically measure. Behaviorism views infants as born as a blank slate known as tabula rasa. Everything that a person becomes, therefore, is a reflection of what they've learned throughout their lives, nothing more and nothing less. Technically, behaviorism was born in 1913 when John Watson suggested that psychology should focus entirely on the prediction and control of behavior. Along with Ivan Pavlov, the two are largely responsible for the introduction of classical conditioning theory based on their experimental research. Classical conditioning is an approach to learning through association, typically association based on similarities in time and space that lead us to link together information. In the case of classical conditioning, the association is between two stimuli, like associating the color purple with your favorite ant, which leads to some sort of response, like having a warm feeling. Operant conditioning is another form of associative learning, but this time it's associations between responses and consequences, like rewards and punishments. This involves learning, for example, that being rude leads to people not liking you, or learning that exercise makes you feel better on days when you're feeling low. Together, classical conditioning and operant conditioning form the foundation of behavioral learning. The other major category of learning is social cognitive learning, which began with the work of John Dollard and Neil Miller, who suggested that attachment is a learned behavior that is acquired through the process of classical and operant conditioning, but was popularized and largely attributed to Albert Bandura and his famous Bobo doll experiments. Social cognitive learning brought attention to the fact that people do not only learn by association, that is, by classical and operant conditioning, but also through observation of others and our environments, which also push them beyond objectivity and what can be observed, measured, and controlled. While Bandura initially termed his theory social learning theory, he eventually renamed it to social cognitive theory to address his growing realization that cognitive factors are also at the heart of learning, behavior, and personality. Julian Roeder and Walter Mischel also contributed to cognitive aspects of social learning, and thus will be discussed as well. While there are many more researchers who have contributed to the developing field of behaviorism and social cognition, the theorists listed on this slide are the ones we'll focus on throughout this lecture. From a psychological perspective, classical conditioning technically began with John Watson, but we'll start by discussing Ivan Pavlov's experiment with dogs to better understand the basics of this approach to learning. As a physiologist, Pavlov was interested in better understanding the process of classical conditioning, or learning by association, in this case, specifically learning to pair a previously neutral stimulus with a stimulus that naturally triggers a response. Let's look at his experiments with dogs to exemplify this process. First, there is a neutral stimulus, which in Pavlov's case was a sound from equipment like a metronome or an electric shock, because these are more precisely measurable than the sound that results from ringing a bell. But nonetheless, we'll use the bell as an example to keep it simple. So the neutral stimulus is a bell. When you ring a bell, the dog does not naturally respond, and if it does respond, it's because it has learned to. At birth, there's no innate response to the sound of a bell. Ring the bell, no response, dog keeps doing what it's doing. In contrast, dogs naturally salivate at the sight and smell of food. You do too, by the way. Just imagine you're eating your favorite food right now, or imagine eating a lemon. Did you start salivating? We call this the unconditioned stimulus because the animal responds without having to learn to do so. It's a built-in response to food. The unconditioned response to food is therefore salivation. So we have our unconditioned stimulus in the food and the unconditioned response, salivation. 
Now the conditioning begins. The goal here is to teach the dog to respond to the bell as though it's food. That is, to have the dog salivate in response to the bell. But how do we teach it to do that? First, we ring the bell, then either at the same time or immediately afterwards, present the dog with food. So, neutral stimulus of the bell alongside or followed by the food. And the dog salivates because that's the natural response to food. You would need to do that for many trials to teach the dog to associate the bell with the food. Eventually, once a dog has been conditioned to do so, the dog will respond to the bell with salivation. At this point, the bell is no longer a neutral stimulus and is instead a conditioned stimulus, which means it's a stimulus that has a learned association. Now, the bell alone will trigger salivation, making salivation also the conditioned response. To review, before and during conditioning, the neutral stimulus is the bell that does not trigger a response by itself. At all points, the unconditioned stimulus is food that always triggers, without any learning needed, the unconditioned response, which is salivation. After conditioning, the bell becomes the conditioned stimulus, which triggers the conditioned response to salivate. Watson's experiment demonstrates that classical conditioning underlies the development of many aversions and phobias. In his Little Albert experiment, he paired a white rat, a neutral stimulus, with a loud banging noise that scared baby Albert. Fun fact, the baby's real name is Douglas. Initially, the baby enjoys playing with the rat, but each time, Watson would make a loud, startling noise right above the poor baby's head to elicit fear. Eventually, after about six trials, the rat was no longer a neutral stimulus, but rather a conditioned stimulus that triggered the conditioned response of fear. Sadly, Albert, aka Douglas, died at the age of six from hydrocephalus, so it's unclear how long his fear of rats, and other furry objects for that matter, would have persisted. While phobias are more intense than aversions, both can be developed and maintained by classical conditioning. I have an aversion to buffet restaurants that developed in response to eating at one the night before I found out that my stomach ache and nausea were due to appendicitis. While the smell of all the different foods melding together never bothered me previously, I associated the smell with how I was feeling that night, and I've never felt the same way about buffet restaurants since. It's important to note, by the way, that these associations can be positive, too. The smell of gingerbread cookies may make you feel warm and cozy. Comfort food, anyone? You'll learn more about classical conditioning in this week's video, Pavlonian Reactions Aren't Just for Dogs. What else is important to know about classical conditioning? First, the acquisition order and timing affect whether classically conditioned learning will take place and to what degree. Delay conditioning, for example, refers to presenting the neutral or conditioned stimulus for a fixed period of time before the unconditioned stimulus is presented immediately afterwards. This is the type of conditioning used in Pavlov's experiment discussed on the previous slide. Trace conditioning, on the other hand, includes a very short time interval between the neutral conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus, which would mean ringing the bell, waiting for some period of time, then presenting the food. Simultaneous conditioning refers to when the neutral conditioned and the unconditioned stimuli are presented at the same time, which would be ringing the bell while presenting the food. Delay, trace, and simultaneous conditioning are all effective options, and they all fall under the category of forward conditioning, which is reflected in the flowchart at the top right of the slide. Whether the unconditioned stimulus is presented immediately afterwards, shortly afterwards, or at the same time, they all work. The opposite is backward conditioning, which refers to situations in which the unconditioned stimulus is presented before the neutral or conditioned stimulus. This typically does not work, at least not as well, because the subject does not learn to associate the neutral stimulus with anything. If you put food down for a dog and then ring a bell, they often don't learn to associate the bell with anything. They need to learn that the bell means food is coming in order to effectively pair those stimuli together and trigger the conditioned response. Other factors that affect conditioning are predictability, intensity, and attention. Predictability refers to how likely the neutral conditioned stimulus signals the unconditioned stimulus. The more predictable, the stronger the association. For example, a dog who bites rarely will induce less fear than one who bites every time. Intensity describes how powerful or strong the unconditioned stimulus is in triggering a response. 
For example, I had a very close encounter with a tiger shark that made me feel very wary of the ocean for a while there. Had the shark been further away, or not face-to-face -face even, I would have likely had a less intense conditioned response to that encounter. Attention refers to what we're paying attention to when the unconditioned stimulus occurred. If you're stung by a bee while paying attention to the song on the radio, you might associate the pain of the bee sting with that song. But if you're paying attention to your sandwich at that moment, you might associate the pain with peanut butter and jelly. Now that we've talked about developing classically conditioned associations, let's talk about what happens to these associations over time. Habituation refers to decreased physiological responsiveness to a stimulus that is presented often. For example, let's say you had a bad experience with fireworks as a kid, and the noise typically gives you panic each time. But then you get a job at Disneyland, and you hear fireworks every night for months on end. Over time, you habituate to the sound, and it triggers smaller and smaller responses each time, such that now you barely even notice them. Habituation is a very important topic to understand in terms of substance use. For example, did you know that a large proportion of opioid overdoses occur in settings that are unusual to the user? Or that day drinking at a music festival or wine tasting excursion does not make you feel more drunk because of the sun, as it's often erroneously attributed? Both of these are examples of a concept known as behavioral tolerance. Unlike other forms of tolerance, behavioral tolerance refers to the classically conditioned association between certain stimuli and the body's response to the substance. When you start blasting Cardi B at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night, your body knows what's coming, and it's not studying. So what does your body do? It prepares to metabolize alcohol. But what happens when out of nowhere you're drinking at 10 a.m.? Your body didn't expect it because there was no conditioned stimulus to alert it, so your body doesn't prepare as it usually does, and you get drunk faster because of it. Your tolerance is effectively lower. Same goes with opioids. Typically, opioid users have rituals and somewhat predictable patterns of use, so the body is often given a heads up to prepare in advance. The problem occurs when the opioids are used at a time or place that is unusual for that person and therefore does not trigger the preparation. The result is lower tolerance, but since the person does not know that their tolerance is related to certain stimuli, they use their typical amount, which is more than their body can handle in that moment. Conditioned stimuli also explain what's known as cue elicited craving, which is craving that is triggered by certain stimuli in the environment. For example, you might crave a cigarette when you drink alcohol because you associate those together. Or perhaps you always crave dessert after eating a meal, even when you aren't hungry. A big part of substance use disorder recovery programs involves identifying these cues and developing new coping responses. Extinction refers to the loss of a conditioned response over time. Let's look at this using my shark encounter. Originally, the ocean was a neutral stimulus. I swam at it often, and I was comfortable doing so. Then, I have my close encounter, at which point the neutral stimulus of the ocean becomes the conditioned stimulus, which was paired with fear from the shark encounter. Therefore, triggered a sense of fear when I went into the ocean, or thought about it for that matter. I could have left it at that, in which case I'd probably still be afraid. But I know too much about learning to let that happen. Avoidance is the best way to keep a phobia going. So what did I do? Take my fear with me into the ocean. Thankfully, it's been safe every time since. So over time, with no more unconditioned shark stimuli, I'm less and less afraid. The conditioned stimulus of the ocean is now almost back to being a neutral stimulus again. It's important to note that extinction means the response is suppressed, not destroyed. Therefore, it can easily reappear. For example, there might be times that I go into the ocean and experience a bit of panic, even if the last 10 times I went in, it didn't bother me at all. That is, it's extinct. Using Pavlov's dog example, even if after withholding the food, which would lead to extinction of the classically associated link between the bell and food, the dog might still sometimes respond to the bell with salivation. But assuming food does not follow, it'll undergo extinction again on its own. Spontaneous recovery, therefore, is the return of an extinguished, conditioned response following a period of extinction. Extinction and spontaneous recovery also occurs with grief and heartbreak related to breakups and death. Over time, the relationship between the conditioned stimulus, things associated with that person, and the conditioned response, the sense of loss, fades to some degree. You're able to go through life without constantly being reminded of that person but spontaneously get a whiff of their favorite perfume or cologne, and you might experience that same sense of loss even decades later. 
The next important concept to understand is stimulus generalization versus stimulus discrimination. Stimulus generalization refers to when we have a classically conditioned response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. For example, little Albert was exposed to rats, but eventually responded with fear to other furry things, including cute bunnies and fur coats. Or perhaps someone who is bullied by someone with red hair tends to dislike all people with red hair. Or if you're me, you've generalized hometown buffet to all buffet restaurants. Stimulus discrimination, on the other hand, is the opposite in that it refers to the ability to differentiate between the conditioned stimulus and other similar stimuli. For example, the difference in seeing a shark fin and a dolphin fin, or the difference between the noise from a firework and a gun. And while there's generalization to other buffet restaurants, there's discrimination between buffet restaurants and other types of restaurants. The bottom picture can also exemplify stimulus generalization and discrimination. For example, a child who just learned the color green might respond to the brownish color as though it's green, but you can discriminate between them, so you wouldn't. The last concept I'll discuss today about classical conditioning is biopreparedness, which refers to the fact that we're hardwired to develop some associations more strongly and more easily than others. We're biologically and instinctively prepared to develop certain conditioned associations that relate to survival. It's easier, therefore, to develop an aversion or a phobia related to stimuli like sharks, snakes, spiders, heights, knives, and toxic smells, compared to things like snails, trees, lights, or couches. Whereas classical conditioning is related to what happens before a response, other forms of associative learning focus on what happens afterwards, otherwise known as the consequences. Thorndike and Skinner wanted to better understand how people learn when there's no reflex or automated response involved, such as when we learn how to cook, write a paper, or perform surgery. Edward Thorndike's research centered around his puzzle box, which was an experimental research approach that studied cats as they attempted to solve problems. Thorndike found that responses that don't help with problem solving gradually become weaker, while those that are successful become stronger. He concluded that the outcome predicts which behaviors are likely to be repeated in the future and which are not. He termed this phenomenon the law of effect because satisfying effects predict more future occurrence and unpleasant effects predict fewer future occurrences. He termed his theory instrumental conditioning because responses are more likely when they are instrumental in producing rewards. B.F. Skinner extended and formalized Thorndike's research. Skinner conducted experiments using an operant chamber, often referred to as a Skinner box, in which animals like a pigeon or rat would press or peck at a lever or disc to receive food from a dispenser. He found that animals learn based on reinforcement and punishment. Behaviors that lead to food are reinforcing, while those that don't or that create harm are punishing. He termed his theory operant conditioning based on the view that animals learn a response by operating in the environment. Or alternatively stated, you could think of an operant as a response that has some effect on the world, good or bad. You'll have an opportunity to see Skinner talk about his research with pigeons in this week's video, Operant Conditioning. Operant conditioning emphasizes the ways in which responses affect future behaviors. Behaviors are either strengthened or weakened, depending on the consequences of those behaviors. There are two major categories that create four types of operant learning reinforcement and punishment, and then positive and negative. Reinforcement means that the behavior is more likely in the future. While this is ideally a desirable behavior, it doesn't have to be. For example, if you find it reinforcing to be mean, that doesn't make it desirable, but it does mean that you'll be more likely to do it in the future. Punishment means that the behavior is likely to decrease in the future, whether that's an undesirable behavior, which is ideal, or a desirable behavior, which is problematic but also possible. For example, you might find it punishing to be assertive because it causes you a lot of anxiety, and thus you might act less assertively each time you experience panic doing so. This next dichotomy of positive versus negative is one of the most misunderstood concepts in psychology. In this case, positive and negative do not mean good and bad. Instead, positive means something is added to the situation, and negative means something is removed or withdrawn from the situation. So this leaves us with four types of operant learning. Positive reinforcement, which refers to behaviors that are likely to increase in the future because something was added. For example, tips at work are positively reinforcing, 
You get something you like, money, as something added to your life for remembering that somebody asked for ketchup. You can think of positive reinforcement as getting a reward, whether that reward is physical, like money, or something that feels rewarding, such as praise. Negative reinforcement also predicts more frequency of that behavior, but this time, rather than adding something desirable, like money, something undesirable is removed. For example, drinking wine may make you feel less stressed, and therefore, you are likely to drink more frequently in response to stress over time. Taking Tylenol for a headache is also negatively reinforcing because your headache is being removed or decreased. You could think of negative reinforcement as relief. Positive punishment refers to behaviors that are less likely to occur in the future because something unpleasant was added. This includes speeding tickets, spankings, and being written up at work. Another way to think of positive punishment is pain, physical and or psychological. Lastly, negative punishment also predicts less frequency of a behavior in the future, but in this case, it's due to something pleasant that is removed. For example, time out and the entire foundation of cancel culture rely on negative punishment. Another way to think of negative punishment is loss. Speaking of time out, the theorist who introduced this strategy is Arthur Statz, who developed a school known as psychological behaviorism. We won't discuss him in this lecture, but you'll learn about his theory in comparison to Skinner and other personality theorists in this week's reading, Behavioral Perspectives on Personality and Self by Phelps, 2015. We've already been over positive and negative reinforcement, but let's review them quickly here since they're often misunderstood. Positive reinforcement is when a behavior is more likely to occur in the future because the person has received some sort of reward for that behavior. That could be a paycheck, an award, a hug, or praise like good job. Negative reinforcement also predicts more of a behavior in the future, but this time it's due to something unpleasant being removed or prevented entirely. Using mute to avoid listening to annoying TV commercials is reinforcing because it provides relief from something you don't like. While substance use tends to be prompted by positive reinforcement at first, such as the fun and the enjoyment, Substance abuse and substance use disorders are typically maintained by negative reinforcement because it removes the withdrawal symptoms that are so unpleasant, which prompts you to keep using the substance more and more over time. There are two specific types of conditioning associated with negative reinforcement, escape and avoidance conditioning. Escape conditioning is the process of learning which responses will stop an unpleasant stimulus that is occurring, for example, taking a leave to treat a headache, turning off your alarm clock in the morning, and saying I'm sorry to lessen the punishment of misbehavior. Avoidance conditioning is similar, but unlike escape conditioning in which the aversive stimulus cannot be avoided and can only be stopped, avoidance conditioning refers to situations in which a certain behavior can result in avoiding the aversive stimulus altogether. So avoidance conditioning refers to learning responses that prevent exposure to an aversive stimulus. For example, slowing down to the speed limit when you see a cop ahead, not driving drunk so you never get a DUI, paying your bills on time so that you can't receive penalties. Avoidance can be a good thing, like avoiding drunk driving, but avoidance can also get us into a lot of trouble. For example, avoiding driving a car after a car accident is a really good way to be scared of driving forever. Avoidance is very powerful and increasingly harder to overcome over time because we never find out that it's okay and develop a sense of safety again. Punishment can be effective as a learning tool, but the research shows that reinforcement is more powerful. Imagine if there were cops driving around who were looking for good drivers to give 500 bucks to. Would that motivate you? Maybe. Unlike reinforcement that predicts more of a certain behavior in the future, punishment should result in less of a behavior. Positive punishment involves adding something aversive, like the medication disulfiram, which makes people very ill when they drink alcohol and therefore is designed to limit drinking because of the punishing association with it. This is known as aversive counterconditioning. Negative punishment is removing something unpleasant, such as taking a child's iPad away from misbehavior. While positive punishment is painful, either psychologically, physically, or both, negative punishment is a form of loss. Not all punishment is created equal, and there are many known drawbacks to using punishment as a primary teaching strategy. For example, children typically learn to suppress or hide these behaviors to avoid getting caught and punished, rather than learning what they're supposed to do instead. They also typically will fear the punisher, which can rupture attachment. Depending on the approach, punishment can model aggression, which is also problematic. 
Overall, it's generally ineffective compared to reinforcement, particularly over the long term. If you are going to use punishment, there are important guidelines to follow in order to make it more effective and safer. First, the response needs to be immediate, consistent, and noticeable. Next, you need to explain what the person did wrong and emphasize the behavior, not the person. It's the difference between, it's unacceptable to throw my phone across the room, and you're such a jerk for throwing my phone. Lastly, it's essential to teach and reinforce a new skill, otherwise no amount of punishment will work. They need to know what to do instead, and they need to be taught how to do it. It also needs to be within their wheelhouse developmentally, so expectations should align with their abilities. Like classical conditioning, operant conditioning is affected by a number of factors. For example, the timing of the reinforcer, or punisher, affects the strength of the associative learning. The faster the timing, the stronger the learning. This is one reason why fast-acting drugs, like IV heroin and cigarette smoking, are more addictive than slow-acting drugs, like edible marijuana. The concepts of discriminative stimulus compared to stimulus delta is important for understanding how operant conditioning works. A discriminative stimulus, also called SD, serves as the signal that a particular response will be reinforced, whereas stimulus delta, referred to S delta, serves as a sign that a response will not be reinforced. It helps us discriminate between contexts in which a behavior is likely to be reinforced compared to when it is likely not to be. Discriminative learning, also known as stimulus control, refers to our ability to engage in stimulus discrimination, which could be the difference between telling a joke your friends would think is hilarious versus telling the same joke to your super conservative grandparents. It's important to be able to discriminate between times that it is a good behavioral choice and times that it's not. Compared to stimulus control, stimulus generalization can also occur, so maybe you think it's okay to say the same joke around anyone your age because your friends would laugh, so you expect all of your peers have the same sense of humor. Similarly, we can generalize the response. So maybe you figure out that telling jokes is a good way to make people like you, so you start acting silly and engaging in pranks at school too. Next, we have prompting, shaping, and chaining. Prompting describes cueing a person or animal about what behavior to perform. At first, you need to prompt often, but over time the prompting can gradually fade until it's no longer necessary. For example, when you're first teaching a child manners, you need to prompt them to say please and thank you, but eventually the child is reinforced enough that they do it without being told. Shaping is the reinforcement of responses as they get closer to the desired response. As with all rewards, the faster the reinforcer is given, the more powerful the learning association. And the more you reinforce successive approximations of the desired behavior, such as asking to go potty even though it was a little too late and the child peed in their clothes anyway, the quicker the child will learn that these are highly valued behaviors and worth continuing to try again in the future. Chaining is the process of stringing behaviors together to accomplish a goal in which each step is reinforced and becomes the discriminative stimulus for the next behavior. Essentially, it's taking a multi-step task and breaking it into a sequence of smaller tasks. For example, on the way to getting a child to do their nighttime routine independently, you start by reinforcing them for putting on their PJs, which would serve as the stimulus for brushing their teeth, let's say. Another important distinction is between primary and secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers refer to events and or stimuli that satisfy a basic survival-related need. In order to qualify as a primary reinforcer, the rewarding power needs to be automatic. That is, it does not need to be learned to have value. Examples include food, sex, sleep, water, clean air. Secondary reinforcers, on the other hand, need to be learned to have reinforcing value. This includes praise, money, honor, and anything else we've learned to like and value throughout life. One of the most important factors in determining the strength of operant learning is the reinforcement schedule. There are five options. One is continuous reinforcement, in which all behaviors are reinforced each and every time they occur. That's hard to keep up, and while extremely effective for acquiring a behavior, it's difficult to maintain and does not work well over time. So most things in life fall under the other four options, which are four types of partial or intermittent reinforcement schedules. Unlike continuous reinforcement schedules, these four options occur some rather than all of the time and are classified according to fixed versus variable and ratio versus interval. Fixed means that the schedule is predictable. Variable means that the schedule is unpredictable. 
Ratio means reinforcement is related to the number of responses, and interval means reinforcement is related to the amount of time that has passed. Let's look at the chart from left to right, where each orange dash reflects reinforcement. First, in blue, is the most effective approach with the highest operant strength, which is variable ratio. An example of variable ratio is a slot machine, which pays out after a certain number of responses. But unlike fixed ratio, that number of responses is unpredictable. This is the most effective because the unpredictability keeps us going. There's no reliable break, ever. So each pull of the slot machine could be the jackpot, and that's very motivating. The line is basically straight because not only is the response rate high, the response is steady too. Next in green is fixed ratio, which is when a behavior is reinforced after a fixed number of responses. Being paid per survey completed is an example of fixed ratio, where your reward is based on how many surveys you got completed. Fixed ratio is an effective schedule because the person learns quickly that the frequency of reward is entirely dependent on the response rate. However, people often take breaks after reach reinforcement before getting started again, which is why the line appears slightly jagged. Next, in purple, is a variable interval line, which reflects a steady, low to moderate response rate, the second lowest after fixed interval. A good example of variable interval is fishing, since it takes a certain unpredictable amount of time for each reinforcement to occur. Another example is checking social media to see if you have any notifications. Lastly, in red, you'll see the fixed interval line, which reflects reinforcement that occurs after a certain interval of time. This has the lowest operant strength and the most scalloped line because people are only typically motivated to do the behavior around the time of reinforcement, so the frequency slows after reinforcement and then speeds up right before reinforcement. For example, imagine that I gave a quiz every Friday. Would you start studying on Saturday or Thursday? Most of you would start closer to Thursday because it's nearer to the time of reinforcement, that is, the time of the quiz. Overall, ratio has higher response rates than interval, and variable has higher response rates than fixed. Another interesting aspect of operant conditioning is that the reward does not need to be intentional or even meaningful. For example, if you happen to wear old socks the day that you had your fastest run ever, you might learn that those socks are lucky. Superstitious behaviors, therefore, often reflect accidental reinforcement of behavior. One reason that continuous reinforcement is not often used, besides the impracticality, is that reinforcers lose value over time. Satiation is the term that refers to being satisfied with regard to a reinforcer, such that it loses value. For example, perhaps playing on the iPad is an exciting reward until you're allowed to have it for 16 hours a day. Then as a reward, it's not very motivating anymore. Satiation is not the same thing as habituation which is a decrease in physiological responsiveness following prolonged exposure to a stimulus. Satiation instead is when a reinforcer loses value. Thinning is the term for reducing the frequency of reward, either by moving to a partial reinforcement schedule or by making the interval longer or the ratio bigger. That helps make the reward feel more meaningful again. Operant extinction, just like with classical extinction, is when the association weakens until it's no longer linked. For example, let's say that your toddler throws a tantrum in the checkout line at the grocery store because usually results in you giving in out of embarrassment and buying them the candy bar. When you stop giving in, the child learns that the behavior, the tantrum, no longer results in the reinforcer, the candy bar. But as anyone who has tried to stop this behavior will tell you, it takes many tries before kids will really break this expectation and therefore stop with the behavior. At first, there tends to be what's called an extinction burst, where the person will actually double down on their behavior when you first try to remove the reinforcer. The kid will tantrum like never before to try to get the reinforcer, but over time, if you consistently resist giving in, they will eventually stop trying. Traditional behaviorism focuses on classical and operant forms of learning, but social cognitive learning takes observational learning and cognitions into account as well. So while behaviorism views personality as a pure manifestation of learning, social cognitivism views personality as a combination of learning and cognition. Social learning and social cognitive theory are considered to be a bridge between traditional behaviorism and cognitive perspectives. The role of cognition was arguably first proposed by Edward Tolman, who demonstrated that rats could learn how to solve a maze even when they are not reinforced for the learning itself. 
They demonstrate their learning when a piece of food is placed at the end, and then they're able to solve the maze as quickly as the rats who are reinforced for their learning all along. This concept is referred to as latent learning, learning that is not observable until the person or animal is motivated to demonstrate it. Social cognitive learning rests on two assumptions. First, the person, the environment, and behavior reciprocally influence each other. And second, that people must be understood as a reflection of their cognitive worlds, including their beliefs, expectations, values, needs, etc. We'll review the major contributions of three social cognitive theorists in the remainder of this lecture, Albert Bandura, Julian Roeder, and Walter Mischel. And while cognitive factors are incorporated into social cognitive views of personality, it's important to note that purely cognitive models exist too, such as George Kelly's personal construct theory, but we'll not be covering those in this course. Bandura originally termed his theory social learning theory, but, as mentioned earlier, eventually renamed it to social cognitive theory in light of the growing realization that cognitive factors influence how we see the world and how we respond to it, and to more effectively distance himself from traditional behaviorism. Unlike Skinner's idea that behavior is only determined by the environment, Bandura believed that thinking and reasoning are important components too. From Bandera's perspective, observational learning, self-efficacy, and reciprocal determinism all play a part in personality development. One of his earliest contributions was the concept of observational learning, which added a third major category to the learning theories along with classical and operant conditioning. At its core, observational learning refers to learning that occurs by watching others, including the behaviors that are demonstrated and the consequences of those behaviors, such as what behaviors are rewarded and which are punished. Observational learning underlies socialization, which is a process through which children learn about which behaviors are socially appropriate and which are not, which as you can imagine is highly culturally specific. Unlike traditional behaviorism, which only acknowledges the stimulus and the response, Bandura proposed four mediational processes that stand between the stimulus and the response and that help to determine whether a new behavior is required. These four processes include the degree of attention to the model's behaviors and consequences, the degree of retention or memory of that behavior, the person's belief about their ability to reproduce the behavior, and their motivation to emulate the behavior. Another important aspect of observational learning is modeling. Modeling refers to the person who is demonstrating the behavior being observed. Symbolic modeling refers to when we observe a film or read a book of a model demonstrating a behavior. Live or in vivo modeling refers to observing a live model who is performing a behavior. And participant modeling is also live, but in this case, the observer has contact with the model who can help guide the person to do the behavior through verbal instruction. Modeling is a very powerful way that children in particular learn, but it affects us as adults too. In the Bobo doll study, children who saw an adult rewarded for aggression were by far the most aggressive in their play following the observation. This can be attributed to the fact that the child learned that it's socially acceptable to act aggressively. The study demonstrated that children learn social constructs and determine the acceptability of behaviors based, at least in part, by observation. This finding has also been applied to the powerful debate as to whether violence in the media affects violence in real life. And the answer is... The correlation's there, but causation has never been fully determined. Three of the factors that have been demonstrated to moderate the relationship between media violence exposure and aggression are age, level of intelligence, and level of initial aggression. The negative effects of media violence decrease as people get older. Children with lower levels of intelligence are more at risk of aggressive outcomes, and children who are less aggressive by nature are less likely to be influenced towards aggression than those who are naturally more aggressive. Another important factor comes down to the model itself. We are more likely to imitate behaviors that are highly rewarded, we're more likely to imitate models that are more similar to ourselves, and we're more likely to imitate models when we find them both attractive and competent. Perceived competence is weighted more highly than attraction. Vicarious conditioning is another term for social observational learning and essentially means that we can learn through vicarious consequences, that is, we do not have to personally be rewarded or punished to learn. This concept leads to the idea of vicarious trauma, which is the phenomenon in which people who empathically engage with the traumatic experiences of another person can experience symptoms of trauma themselves. 
Vicarious trauma is also known as compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress, and secondary victimization. It occurs to people who work with survivors of trauma, most notably as therapists, social workers, health professionals, and first responders. The hallmark of Bandura's theory is the concept of reciprocal determinism, which is essentially the view that situational factors, cognitive factors, and behaviors all influence each other. Essentially, there is a three-way interaction between the person and their cognitions, their behaviors, and their environment. Cognitive factors include our self-efficacy, schemas, beliefs, etc., whereas situational factors refer to the context of the situation in which the behavior occurs. Behaviors are anything we do that is associated with a consequence of any kind. Ultimately, according to Bandura, our personalities reflect this three-way interaction. One of the core cognitive factors Bandura explored is the concept of self-efficacy, which refers to our level of confidence in our abilities to perform a given behavior. Bandura believed that self-efficacy is learned and developed through our social experiences. Self-efficacy affects the behaviors we decide to imitate and our perceived ability to be successful in performing these behaviors. Another influential theorist who contributed to social cognitive learning is Julian Roeder, who actually began studying social learning before Bandura, although he isn't as well recognized for it. Also, unlike Bandura, who caught on to the cognitive aspects later into his career, Roeder was interested in the cognitive aspects of social learning from the start. Roeder proposed that in order to effectively predict behavior, four variables must be considered. First, behavior potential which refers to the likelihood of engaging in a particular behavior in a given situation. For example, if you're annoyed about waiting for your food at a restaurant, you could yell at the server, wait patiently, ask to speak to the manager, etc. We'll engage in whichever behavior has the highest potential based on the other three variables. Expectancy refers to our subjective probability that a given behavior will cause a specific result. To have high expectancy, the person must believe that they have the capacity to do it, which is self-efficacy, and believe that the behavior will result in the desired effect. You're not going to start studying for the bar exam an hour before it starts because you know it'll be insufficient preparation. Reinforcement value refers to the desirability of the outcome, which is also highly subjective. Some people find money very rewarding and motivating, while others are more motivated by attention, affection, achievement, or praise. Depending on the outcome, we are more or less motivated to engage in a particular behavior. If expectancy and reinforcement value are high, the behavioral potential is high, and vice versa. Therefore, the formula is that the behavioral potential equals the function of expectancy combined with reinforcement value. Lastly, the psychological situation describes the fact that we're individuals with unique experiences. While it's not part of his equation, Roeder was careful to remind us that everyone's experience is subjective and must be considered when interpreting their behaviors. Roeder also differentiated between specific constructs and generalized ones. Specific constructs reflect particular situational factors that make a behavior more or less likely, versus general constructs, which are broader and not as situationally specific. The more specific, the more accurate we tend to be. The more general, the more room for error. For example, if we know Marissa is conscientious overall, we can generally predict that she'll act conscientiously in most situations. But sometimes she's tired, overwhelmed, or unmotivated, so there will also be times that we're inaccurate in our prediction. But if we know Marissa's dream in life is to be a lawyer, we can very likely predict that she'll take a conscientious approach to studying for the bar exam. This speaks to the person-situation debate and interactionism that we looked at in the trait section of this course and that we'll also explore again on the following slide. But first, let's look at one of Julian Roeder's biggest contributions to psychology, which is the concept of locus of control. Locus of control describes our generalized expectancy for control of reinforcement. Other ways stated, it's the general belief related to how much control we have over what happens to us in our lives, which is developed and maintained in relation to our social experiences. It is related but also distinct from the concept of self-efficacy, because while self-efficacy describes the strength of our belief in our abilities to do something, locus of control describes our beliefs about how much power and control we have over situations and outcomes in our lives. Those with a strong internal locus of control on one end of the spectrum tend to believe that they have a lot of control and that what happens in life reflects the results of their efforts, actions, and decisions, 
Whereas those on the other side of the spectrum, with a strong external locus of control, tend to believe that things happen to them, that they don't have control, and that what happens in life reflects luck, other people, the environment, and aspects beyond their control. It's the difference between, I failed that test because I didn't study hard enough, compared to, I failed that test because the teacher didn't prepare me well enough. Or, I'm late to work because I didn't wake up early enough. Or, I'm late to work because it's raining and people don't know how to drive. According to Makri Botsari and Stample, it's 2020, people with a stronger internal locus of control and higher self-efficacy tend to have more intrinsic motivation compared to those with a more external locus of control and lower self-efficacy. Of course, it's rarely truly either or, but as individuals, we tend to err towards one side or the other. And it's not all good or bad. Overall, those with an internal locus of control tend to have more easily access motivation towards goals. But those with an external locus of control handle situations in which they really don't have control better because they don't look toward themselves as the source of blame. So it's nice to have an internal locus of control when things are going well, but when life hits hard and there's not much you can do about it, it's nice to see it as external to yourself. There's an optional assessment in your module this week called Locus of Control if you're interested in exploring where you fall on this spectrum. Learned helplessness and learned optimism or learned hopefulness are not attributed directly to Roeder, but are very much related to Locus of Control and his proposal that many mental health conditions can be traced back to maladaptive behaviors motivated by low expectancy and unrealistically high and or unobtainable goals that prevent reinforcement and lead to a continual sense of failure. Learned helplessness is a process in which a person or animal stops trying to exert control, typically because they've determined that nothing they do will affect the situation. It's not about whether they actually have control. It's the expectation of control. And if you don't feel you have it, you're on your way to feeling helpless. This is particularly true for people who have a stronger external locus of control. The opposite is learned optimism or learned hopefulness, which, like it sounds, can also be learned. The research shows that people with a more optimistic cognitive style tend to be more resilient, so it's worth working on if learned helplessness is affecting you, which is particularly common for individuals experiencing depression. If you're interested in learning more, there is an optional article in this week's module by Scott Barry Kaufman that summarizes three strategies presented by Diane Tomasulo in his book, Learned Hopefulness, The Power of Positivity to Overcome Depression. Walter Mischel was Julian Roeder's graduate student at Ohio State University, who later became a faculty member at Stanford University, where he worked with Albert Bandura. Mischel brought attention to what he viewed as the core issue with trait theories of personality, which is that the data does not support consistency across situations. That is, personality traits are highly situationally specific, and therefore, a personality state, the person's temporary way of being, reflects the situational context as well as the person's underlying traits. This led to the person-situation debate first introduced in this course in Unit 1. Mischel proposed that cognitive processes are used to interpret the situation, such as the needs of the moment, the degree of motivation, the person's values, goals, judgments, beliefs, self-efficacy, etc., that pertain to the situation at hand, and the behavior in a given situation reflects that cognitive interpretation. So Catherine might be an agreeable person, with people who are also agreeable, but becomes quickly reactive and abrasive to people she views as rude or demeaning. Or perhaps you're low in openness when it comes to museums and art, but high in openness when it comes to traveling and adventure. Mischel argued that the resolution to the personality paradox, therefore, is dynamic and takes into account both that behavior is consistent and indicates their disposition in general or overall, and that people vary across individual situations depending on the environment and thus is also situationally specific. Some traits are more consistent than others. Intelligence, for example, tends to be fairly consistent, but most are highly affected by the situation, like aggression, patience, friendliness, and empathy. According to Hank 2015, even dimensions like self-esteem have a trait component, which speaks to a person's overall self-esteem, and a state component that pertains more to their emotional experience in that moment. You might be a confident person, but can still have states in which you feel insecure. The more information you have about someone's if-then patterns, the more accurately you can predict their behavior in a given situational context. Ultimately, Mischel posited that an individual's behavior, which he termed personality signature, is best viewed as an if-then contingency, 
That is, how we act is an interaction of a person's traits and the situation, including the environmental context, as well as the thoughts, feelings, goals, expectancies, values, self-regulation skills, and other cognitive affective factors that influence how we behave, which he referred to as cognitive affective units, and acknowledged are affected by traditional behavioral learning, social learning, genetics, and everything else that makes us who we are. Speaking of self-regulation skills, Mitchell is arguably most well-known for his contribution to the understanding of delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is contrasted against instant gratification and is correlated with a subjectively defined successful life. The marshmallow study involved giving preschoolers a marshmallow and telling them that if they didn't eat it after 15 minutes, they would get a second marshmallow as a reward. Two of three children ate the marshmallow during that 15-minute period, leaving one in three who were able to resist the temptation and effectively delay gratification in order to receive the bigger reward. You'll learn more about this study and get to see some cute videos of children trying to resist the marshmallow from a replication study in Colombia in this week's video, Don't Eat the Marshmallow. Mitchell later collaborated with Bandura to do a similar study, but this time with modeling. Instead of marshmallows, they gave the child a small candy bar and said that if they could wait it out, they'd earn a larger candy bar. Children who were exposed to a live model who engaged in an alternate strategy to control their temptation were the most affected, followed by those who were read a description of an alternate strategy. Those with no model performed similarly to the ones in the original marshmallow study, with the majority choosing to eat the small candy bar rather than wait for the larger one. This study tells us that self-control is learned, at least to some extent. The ability to self-regulate and to delay gratification is helpful for reaching goals, particularly higher order goals that require delaying gratification along the way in order to achieve them. For example, if you want to become a physician, you have to delay gratification throughout each stage academically and professionally, which is easily a decade post high school. Each party you skip to ensure a high grade, each summer trip you don't take so that you can volunteer at a health clinic, takes you one step closer to your ultimate goal, but it's a lot of sacrifice along the way. Peterson and Seligman, 2004, found that self-regulation, along with perseverance, are most closely related to the big five factor of conscientiousness, which makes sense because of the emphasis on controlling the self towards goal achievement. Research shows that people who believe traits can be intentionally molded and adjusted over time tend to be more resilient, which you'll learn about in this week's reading by Jaeger and Dweck, 2012, entitled Mindsets That Promote Resilience, When Students Believe That Personal Characteristics Can Be Developed. One interesting application of learning theory is the relationship between culture and consumer behaviors. Demoij and Hodstad, 2011, present a model of consumer decision-making that includes the who attributes of the person, including their personality and self-concept, and the how of the process, including social processes, such as motivation and emotion, as well as mental processes like cognition, learning, and language. Culture shapes our personalities in deep and meaningful ways, and therefore our behavioral choices too. Two broad categories of culture are termed individualistic and collectivistic. Individualistic cultures like the United States tend to view traits as relatively fixed aspects of personality and tend to describe personality in relation to the self. I am generous, or she is generous whereas collectivistic cultures tend to view traits as reflective of situational context and describe personality in terms of others. My family views me as generous, or she has provided generous support for my family. When we look at the comparison between these two cultural groups, one difference that emerges is the emphasis on I versus we. Individualistic cultures think of the self first and view personality as individual attributes, whereas collectivistic cultures identify themselves in relation to the group and view personality as a reflection of the self combined with context. This aligns with the difference in the communication strategies. Individualistic cultures are characterized by low-context communication, which means words are the primary means of communication, and therefore words must be precise and clear, compared to collectivistic cultures that use context to interpret meaning and therefore is more nuanced and layered, more reading between the lines, so to speak. For example, in the U.S., if a speaker asks if anyone has questions, someone will raise their hand and or simply blurt out their question. But in a country like Japan, people will make subtle eye contact, which is meant to signify that they have a question. Similarly, individualistic societies value uniqueness and variety. 
It is important that people and products are distinct, whereas collectivistic societies value conformity and trust. From a consumer perspective, that leads brands who want to advertise to individualists to focus on persuasion and moving directly to the point of the product, whereas collectivists respond best to brands that build relationships with the consumer and develop trust with them. And while individualists tend to express emotions of any kind, collectivists tend to have a more subtle approach to expressing their emotions and are particularly reluctant to express socially undesirable emotions like anger because it disrupts social harmony and communicates a lack of emotional control. Ultimately, individualistic cultures teach children that the self is an autonomous entity that is responsible for itself whereas collectivistic cultures teach children that the self is interdependent and cannot be isolated from social context. That has tremendous influence on how we learn to see the world and our place in it. Even how we feel about ourselves is highly influenced by culture. Individualists derive esteem from themselves, such as from individual achievement, whereas collectivists feel best in relation to interpersonal dynamics, such as being friendly or supportive. If you're interested in this topic, I recommend the optional article available in your module, Cross-Cultural Consumer Behavior, a Review of Research Findings by Demoige and Hodstead, 2011, which not only explores these two broad dimensions of culture, but also evaluate the role of other distinguishing factors like power distance and uncertainty avoidance.